good. Super. Marilyn Musgrave, everybody. Thank you to the Susan B. Anthony list. Is this a campaign for life gala or what? I'm telling you what, you, you all are a sight for sore eyes for the Pence family tonight. More on that in a moment. I want to thank, I want to thank, uh, I want to thank uh, Marilyn Musgrave. It's great to see her and Mr. Mustache here. I didn't know his name for the first few terms that you were in Congress with us. Wonderful to have you here to see Michelle Bachman, to see Virginia Fox, who I think has run back off to uh, the floor, the battle for more spending cuts. I tell people I, I love and admire and I fear Virginia Fox. <laughs> so congratulations to her tonight. To all the members that were here, I, I see uh, Randy Holgren is in the house, Vicki Hartzler, and I uh, mentioned Michelle Bachman, Senator Ke uh, Kelly Ayotte, who I got to know in New Hampshire and has already hit the ground running in the United States Senate. I know you'll hear from her in a minute. It's just a real thrill to be here. And I, I want to tell you, I, I didn't know that the Susan B. Anthony Fund won that like grassroots of the year thing, but I, I got to tell you, Marjorie Dannenfelser ought to win that every single year. She is the best leader in the pro-family movement in the United States of America. And Marjorie, we appreciate you. Thanks to Jane Abraham and for her visionary leadership in this wonderful organization and uh, for the way that you and, and Spence have brought this along, for Frank Cannon and the whole team here. I know uh, former Congressman Mike Ferguson and Maureen are in the house, uh, two of the great pro-life leaders on Capitol Hill were here. Maureen has shown up, as Karen pointed out, with baby in tow tonight, fresh out of the wrapper, so there'll be one doing about another. But it's going to be another eight months, and we'll be right back to the... Great to see you guys. And, and you know, I never know whether you... When I used to see him, I used to go, I don't know, do you call you Governor Allen? Do you call you Senator Allen? We're going to all be calling him Senator Allen before too terribly long. And it is wonderful to know that, George. It's good to see you. Thanks for clearing that up for Senator Webb. We really... Uh, Appreciate that very much, and uh, you know, I can say I was for Ken Cuccinelli before it was cool. I really can, and uh, General Cuccinelli and his wife Tiero here, and uh, he, if you didn't see it, if you, if you really are mind-numbingly bored tonight, go back and watch C-SPAN. I'm sure the judiciary hearing uh, will be played sometime between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m., literally watched by tens of Americans, Ken, and uh, But we had, we had him at the hearing today, and I'll tell you what, he, he just did a, it was your first hearing, is that right? Good. We need you back, uh, fighting for, uh, against the uh, individual mandate in Obamacare. We have no more clarion voice in America than Ken Cuccinelli on that. And you know, they say that behind every great man is a woman rolling her eyes. And in my case tonight, I actually came in with three. My wife, 25 years, Karen Pence, who co-chairs tonight's event, is with us. As Marjorie knows, Karen is actually the most pro-life member of the Pence family. Uh, and the other uh, eye rollers in the family are here, my 17 and 16-year-old daughters, Charlotte and Audrey, are in the house, and I'm going to embarrass them desperately, and they won't speak to me for days. It is a thrill to be here. It's a thrill to have a chance to, to celebrate uh, this, this extraordinary work that is the Susan B. Anthony List and the difference that you all have made. Um, and I, I, I know that I follow on the heels of some luminary voices that have stood at this podium for the Susan B. Anthony List. I know Governor Tim Pawlenty, who is a friend, 
and an important voice for life on the national stage. Sarah Palin spoke at a breakfast for the Susan B. Anthony list. I admire her. You know, I've, you've probably seen this Sarah Palin's Alaska show. A lot of, I mean, it's pretty, let's, you know, let's put it out there. It's pretty impressive, you know, the whole hunting and fishing and shooting and, you know, a lot of you wouldn't know, you know, I'm really pretty outdoorsy too. Um, I mean, I don't have a show, but I, uh, but I, I, I uh, there was, it was really, we've had some pretty tough winters, you know, storms this winter, and it reminded me of a couple of weeks ago of last year in Indiana. I was literally, it was a whiteout, it was a blizzard, it was unbelievable. I literally had to abandon my car, I had to hike it out, I, I, I had to, I couldn't make it to any shelter, so I had to kill this caribou with my bare hands. <laughs> gutted it, pulled all the entrails out. I literally crawled inside the carcass <laughs> to survive. And uh, now, now, granted, the, uh, the zookeeper was pretty upset, and, uh, and that Girl Scout troop is probably never going back there again. So, uh, but it is great to be here. I, uh, you know, we, co we come here in the midst of... Uh, the aftermath of a lot of speculation about our future, we were very humbled by it and prayerfully determined that our calling is a little closer to home. Vin Weber comforted me tonight saying, don't worry, Mike, your future is all behind you. <laughs> I joked with a couple colleagues after a lot of the fuss, after we'd made our decision not to run for national office, they actually said to me, you know, all these nice things. And I said, you know, if I, I don't know how many nice things would be written and said about me by ruling out running for president. I'd have done it years ago. But let me put it out there, we are seriously considering as a family and we invite your prayers as we consider running for governor of the state of Indiana. Of course, that reminds me of a story. There was this uh, former governor of Indiana, as the story goes, that was uh, in the limo, he's with the first lady, they pulled into a gas station and a uh, gas station attendant came out, started pumping the gas, all of a sudden the first lady jumps up and, and climbs out of the limousine and throws her arms around this gas station attendant, all covered with grease. And they're talking, they're laughing. The governor's watching all this go on, and they're going on and on out there. And again, she gives him a big, enormous hug, a kiss on the cheek. She climbs back in the limousine, and the detail in the car start to speed away. So the governor looks at the first lady, and he says, uh, you, know, what was, you know, what was that all about? <laughs> And she said, uh, oh, gosh, I'm sorry. She said, that was Dave. I mean, you know, like Dave, who I dated for like my whole high school <laughs> years. And then the governor said, oh, yeah, yeah, Dave. <laughs> yeah. And she said, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, you know, I was just, you know, I was just thinking, I mean, <laughs> what if you'd have married Dave? <laughs> The first lady said, without a beat, if I'd have married Dave, he'd be governor. <laughs> I don't know why I thought of that after I introduced Karen to you, but it was, maybe someday you'll know. Well, Henry V said, to, I want to tell you what Henry VIII said to his fifth wife, I won't keep you long. We've got, uh, you're going to hear from the senator tonight. You're going to have a lot more fellowship tonight. But I have a couple things on my heart I want to share. But these are very trying times in the life of our nation. Our economy is struggling. Our national government is awash in a sea of debt. And amidst these struggles, it might make some sense for us to focus our energy just on jobs and spending. But you all know in this room, we must never remain silent when great moral battles are being waged. Those who would have us ignore the battle being fought over life in this country have forgotten the lessons of history, I would offer. As in the days of a house divided, America's darkest moments have come when economic arguments trump moral principles. It would be Thomas Jefferson who said, the care and protection of human life and not its destruction 
is the only legitimate object of good government. Thank you all for remaining focused on the sanctity of life, even in these difficult days. Because of you in this room and your extraordinary generosity and hard work, I stand before you today a member of a new Republican majority on Capitol Hill. And let me tell you, we've been busy. Like those first couple of weeks, we all, we all rallied together and we voted to repeal Obamacare lock, stock, and barrel. We brought legislation to reinstate the Hyde Amendment and to deny federal funding for abortion at home and abroad in every area of our national government. And thanks to all of you, thanks to the candidates that you back through the Susan B. Anthony list, maybe this very night we may, in fact, pass a bill in the House that it would deny all federal funding to Planned Parenthood of America. Thank you, and, I, and I, hope, I, I hope in every one of your hearts you know that it's a standing ovation for all of you. You made that possible. When we started this fight back in 2007 and came up short again and again, uh, we could only hope that someday men and women around the country would get behind extraordinary leaders like those that are in the room today who were not in the room then. And it's deeply humbling for me and my family to be a small part of it. We're not just going to settle to deny public funding to abortion in this fiscal year to abortion providers, but I'm proud to tell you that with more than 160 co-sponsors, we are going to bring legislation to the floor of the Congress that will say we will not provide any public funding through Title X to any abortion provider ever again. We will not rest. We will not rest until the largest abortion provider in America is no longer the largest recipient of federal funding under Title X. And I got to tell you, though, I got to tell you, it's been uh, quite a couple of days for me. If you've been, don't go home and Google me, okay? It's not pretty out there. I woke up this morning, I read in Politico, Marjorie probably saw that, Politico said, Mike Pence has declared war on Planned Parenthood. Wow. That was a, another news outlet said that I, I had an obsession about denying funding for Planned Parenthood. I, you know, I guess, I guess consistency in Washington, D.C. can only be explained by mental defect or emotional imbalance. Another news outlet said this Indiana Republican is on a one-man mission to cut off all the group's federal funding. Let me assure you, it is not a one-man or one-woman mission. House Republicans are united in our collective determination to end this funding once and for all. The highest compliment I got, though, was, uh, was former Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Don't you just love saying that? <laughs> former Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Now, Nancy said that the Pence Amendment that will be considered by end of business tomorrow was, quote, extreme legislation that was, quote, the most comprehensive and radical assault on women's health in our lifetime. Just extraordinary. 
You know, my colleague Sam Johnson, the Vietnam POW and legendary patriot, told me one time after a similar battle, he came over on the floor, put his hand on my shoulder, and he said, Now, Mike, you've got to remember, they only shoot at you when you're over the target. <laughs> I expect that there's a lot of truth in that. The truth is, men and women, I'll tell you, I think they're all worked up on this issue because we're winning this fight. We're winning hearts and minds in America. We're on the verge not only of ending public funding for abortion and abortion providers, I believe with all my heart, we are at the beginning of the end of Roe versus Wade. I think we're winning this fight because of the tireless work of pro-life advocates since 1973 who've never relented in their efforts to stand for the unborn and the defenseless. We're winning, I believe, because of the compassionate work of crisis pregnancy centers across the country who each and every day are touching hearts and lives. I also believe with all of my heart that we're winning because of something that has no organization to it. And I think something very special is happening in the quiet councils between mothers and daughters, between grandmothers and granddaughters. Women who were caught up in the lie of abortion, pulling those dearest to them aside and telling them other than what the culture is telling them. And I believe that it's, it's saving broken lives and broken hearts. And lastly, I think we are winning because of men and women like you in this room who have not relented in your determination to send men and women of principle and courage who are committed to the sanctity of life into the legislatures of this nation. And I commend you. We're winning this fight. But we must fight on. We must not lose heart in this battle. And I'll leave you with two thoughts about how we sustain this effort. Because if this last week is any indication, it's going to get rough from here in. <laughs> it's, going to get, uh, it's going to get louder on the other side. And we're going to have to find it in ourselves to sustain the will to go forward. So a couple of thoughts on that, and then I'll close. First, take the long view. You know, we're celebrating this month the uh, 100th year uh, since the birth of the 40th President of the United States of America, Ronald Wilson Reagan. It is noteworthy to, to remind ourselves that the only book President Reagan ever put his signature on during his eight years in office was about the sanctity of life. Abortion and the Conscience of a Nation was a small booklet. It was derived from an essay in the Human Life Review. The president published a short essay to mark the 10th anniversary of Roe v. Wade in the spring of 1983. He talked about the long view, and he spoke in terms that I think we should be reminded of as we continue in this battle. The president wrote, and I quote, Despite the formidable obstacles before us, we must not lose heart. This is not the first time our country has been divided by a Supreme Court decision that denied the value of certain human lives. The Dred Scott decision of 1857 was not overturned in a day or a year or even a decade. He went on to write, at first only a minority of Americans recognized and deplored the moral crisis brought about by denying the full humanity of a few. But that minority persisted and finally prevailed. They did so by appealing to the hearts and minds of their countrymen to the truth of human dignity under God. So let's heed the word of my favorite president <laughs> and take the long view. Secondly, let's appropriate those resources that are necessary when we are seeking great ends in the culture. One of my other heroes was William Wilberforce, the great 19th century parliamentarian 
who we all know from books and a popular movie, led the effort to end slavery in Great Britain. One historian wrote that it was, beyond a shadow of a doubt, the greatest miracle in the history of Western civilization that a nation would voluntarily outlaw slavery throughout its kingdom and its reign. Wilberforce brought that about. But he was, as one biography I read reminded me, he was beset by the same weariness, by the same tedium, and by the same virulent opposition that we encounter in this movement today. But he had words about how he maintained his focus and his energy. He spoke of spending time privately in devotions and in prayer. He credited his hourly sabbatical every day and his weekly sabbatical every Sunday with giving him, and I quote, a time to remember the great ends for which life is given and the immortal hopes by which it must be sustained. Take time in this battle to reflect on the great ends for which life is given. We are not put on this earth to advance ourselves. We are not put on this earth just to move to the next thing. We are put on this earth to do his work, to defend the defenseless, to stand for the truth of history. And there is no greater truth than that every human life is sacred and precious. Great ends for which life is given, sustained by immortal hopes, and they're all close. As we fight for life and we think of these great ends, let's remember who we're fighting for and whose cause we are employed. In Proverbs it reads, if you falter in a time of trouble, how small is your strength? Rescue those being led away to death. Hold back those staggering towards slaughter. And if you say we knew nothing about this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who guards your life know it? Will he not repay everyone according to what they have done? Men and women, supporters all of the Susan B. Anthony list, you're changing hearts and minds across the land. You're making it possible to achieve great ends. But I implore you with all of my heart to keep fighting. Take the long view. Refresh yourself to remember that this is not a political cause. It is not the battle of the moment. But this is his story of which we have the privilege of being a part. And know that as you change our nation and change our laws, you're changing and redeeming the heart of this, the greatest nation in the history of the world. May God bless the Susan B. Anthony list and all of you who generously make the extraordinary work that takes place in this organization possible. We are all, and they are all, in your debt forever. Thank you and God bless you. It's an honor to be with you tonight. An honor for our family to join us. Thank you.